Okay. All right. So um, we've got quite a lot of participants online, which is awesome. Um, welcome everyone to the QSI seminar this week. And we'll actually have a, a second seminar a bit later on this week, which we will see advertised uh, in the next day or so. But um, to join us today is Joe Fitzsimmons from Horizon Quantum Computing. Joe has a has been in the field for uh, probably more years than he'd want me to say. Uh, um, <laughs> he's done a lot of foundational work in complexity theory, algorithms, architectures, and a whole range of things across the, you know, the whole gamut of the theory spectrum, actually. Um, so I'm really quite excited to hear uh, what Joe has to say today and to talk about uh, his company, Horizon Quantum Computing, and the things that it's doing. Um, so just generally, just before we get started, you know, Joe's going to present, we're doing this via Zoom. If you want to ask a question, I think it's okay because we haven't got a thousand people on this thing to just unmute yourself and ask the question directly. Um, and yeah, generally keep yourselves on mute, keep your videos down, keep your videos off and let Joe get on with the presentation. All right, thanks very much Joe for joining us. Great, uh, thanks very much. And thanks for, uh, thanks for inviting me to do this. Um, so, I haven't been talking a huge amount in the last year about what we've been doing at Horizon. Um, and so I wanted to take the, the chance to, to talk about what we're doing at kind of a fairly high level. So this isn't necessarily the typical research talk where I will, you know, introduce some problem and, you know, talk through the background on the problem, how we get to a solution. Uh, instead, I'm going to give kind of a broad overview of, um, of what we're doing at Horizon, the kinds of problems we encounter, uh, and why what we think we're doing is valuable. Um, there will be some results in it. Um, some of the stuff is not new, some of the stuff is new. Um, some of the stuff's been around the community for a long time and we're just implementing stuff. Um, but this should give you some idea of at least the type of thing we're trying to do and uh, you know, our view on how we should go about programming quantum computers. Um, Okay, first of all, I should explain the title, why I, why I call it From Qs to Qubits. Um, what I'm gonna talk about is ultimately trying to get from classical code, like MATLAB code or Octave code or Julia code or something like this, to something that runs on a quantum computer with appropriate acceleration. So it takes advantage of quantum techniques, uh, interference between different computational branches to yield a speed up in the code that computes the same thing. Um, okay. Uh, okay, so I guess first of all, I should uh, introduce the team. Um, about a year ago, uh, slightly over a year ago, myself, uh, Siwi Tan, uh, and uh, Li Meng uh, Zhao, who was my PhD student, uh, left SUTD uh, and we started Horizon. So since then, a few more have joined. Uh, ben Krieger, uh, who was previously at Delft and in Germany as well. Um, Yvonne Gao, who works with us half time. Uh, she's usually with ASTAR in Singapore. Um, and a, a couple of others, Kyle and Amar, uh, and Sharon, our office managers here, and a, a few other people. Um, so there's a couple of people not listed here. Um, and this is mostly because I don't have photos of them. Um, so we're a pretty small team, uh, and we're trying to, uh, we're trying to make something that we think is a little bit interesting. So, um, this is kind of a salesy slide and I apologize for that, but basically our, our goal is to try to make quantum computing useful. And that sounds like a, a very, um, thing to say, but what I mean by this is that if you want to make use of a quantum computer, there's two things you need. You need, you need the quantum computer. So someone needs to build the hardware. They need to build hardware good enough to actually do something useful. But then there's another problem. Once you have that hardware, you also need to figure out how to take advantage of it to solve a particular problem that you have. Uh, and so, you know, I say, well, there's a few different kinds of people we would like to, to make it useful for. Um, and basically our goal is to make programming tools um, but not just for the quantum community, also for com conventional software engineers as quantum computing begins to mature. Uh, and 
there's a there's a reason for this you know the number of people that work on quantum algorithms and stuff like that is small the number of people that have github accounts is large it's like 100 million people or something like that um and there have been a lot of experiments with how do you uh democratize programming of quantum computing and stuff like that um you see efforts from ibm and others to um to open source development tools and to try to encourage people to use their platforms partly with the hope that this will lead to a boom in algorithms um and i think it's probably fair to say that that hasn't really happened to a large degree most of what you see implemented are variational techniques they they're all relatively similar uh, in nature um but we don't see new uh, we don't see fundamentally new algorithms emerging from the community of users that was not already in the quantum computing community so there, there's definitely there's definitely new algorithms coming out all the time from you know from people with background in that area but it's not necessarily the case that people coming in from outside that work in other areas of computer science and things like this um have necessarily been you know jumping on these these uh, platforms and suddenly inventing all sorts of new applications for quantum computing. Um, so we have a kind of strange approach to this, uh, and it's based on uh, based on abstraction. So, in order to give you an introduction to this or to set the background for it, um, I wanted to show you kind of broadly some milestones in the history of uh, programming languages. So, you know, back in the 50s, you had things like microcode and assembly. And then as you moved on, you got languages like basic C and so on that had increasingly high levels of abstraction. Um, so if you write something in MATLAB or Python, you don't care at all really about how your processor works. You don't need to take care of any of that details. So that's all taken care of. Uh, that's all taken care of for you by the interpreter. Um, whereas, you know, C is a bit closer and once you get to assembly you really do care about where the individual registers are on your processor and stuff like this um our goal basically is to abstract to a high enough level that you can program both a conventional computer and a classical computer sorry a conventional computer and a quantum computer using the same language um so uh so if we abstract to a high enough level um and you know i kind of what I want to show is that MATLAB, Octave, these types of languages are already a sufficiently high level that you can use this to express what you want to do and then take that code and compile it into something that makes use of quantum algorithms techniques uh, to gain an advantage, to gain a performance advantage. Um, in terms of how we do this, uh, the, the basic steps are, you know, we take in some conventional source code. Uh, we try to make some abstract representation of what's going on there. So like an abstract syntax tree. Uh, from that, we try to con construct a, a kind of quantum algorithm, uh, turn that into some circuit representation, uh, turn that into a, nat a native circuit for the device, and then ultimately into whatever the native operations are for the device. Um, so that might mean outputting circ or Quill or uh, Quasm code, or it might mean outputting pulse sequences. Um, so the way we do this broadly, we have a compiler that is composed of four different levels. So at the base, we have something uh, that's a gate level language. We call it hydrogen. It doesn't really matter what the name is. Uh, we had a lot of trouble picking names. So we just went with the, the first four uh, products of uh, in um, stellar nuclear synthesis. So uh, we start with hydrogen, that's kind of gate focused. Uh, helium is a bit like quantum basic. So you're still doing gate operations, but you also have basic loops and conditional statements and subroutines. Uh, beryllium, you can think of a little bit more like quantum C or something like that. So you start having the ability to do uh, structs and functions and, uh, and classes, things like this. And then the highest level uh, is basically some kind of common subset of MATLAB and Octave um, that we're starting to extend a bit. Um, 
that we call Carbon, but basically it's a classical language. You can run this on your computer. Okay, so broadly the way our compiler works is we, we have these four levels. Um, at, the, at the highest level, the, this classical code, you can run it just straight on a CPU or GPU. Uh, as you go lower level, uh, as you go down this stack, the remaining languages are all quantum uh, at decreasing levels of abstraction. So Beryllium is pretty high level. Uh, as I say, it lets you do functions and classes and structs and things like this. Uh, it also lets you do point, uh, pointers, which are super useful. Uh, and I'll show you an example of that uh, in a little bit. Uh, below that, we have something that is, as I say, like quantum basic, so uh, subroutines, loops, and so on. But at this level, it's pretty useful to be able to do resource counting. Because if you care about things like, for example, um, you know, you care about estimating resources for particular algorithms if you're interested in post-quantum crypto or if you're interested in, um, I don't know, predicting what the resource costs are going to be for a particular algorithm. Um, this, lets you, this lets you write it up, uh, you know, uh, in a way that you don't have to specify it gate by gate um, to still do optimization on the code. Um, and so you can do resource counting at this level without having to expand everything into a massive number of gates. Uh, and then at the lowest level, there's a gate level language that's just, you know, literally gate by gate telling the device what to do. And that interfaces with the hardware. Um, okay, so I'm gonna talk about these in basically reverse order. So I'll start talking about what we're doing on the hardware front, uh, then move up to the gate level, then the low level, uh, high level quantum language, and then ultimately this conversion of classical code to quantum code. Um, I won't be able to cover everything we're doing on this front, and uh, I should say this is very much work in progress. So there's still a lot of things that we're building. Not everything uh, fully connects together at the moment. There's still quite a lot to be done. Um, but any concrete examples I show you will be stuff that's implemented. Okay. So uh, starting with hardware and characterization, um, the reason we care about this at all is that I don't know how many of you have tried to run stuff on real hardware, um, particularly on the cloud-based stuff, the, the Rigetti stuff or IBM or, or whoever. Um, the gates aren't perfect. The gates are very far from perfect. Um, and the noise is not the simple kind of noise that theorists like to think of. It's not. IID, you know, depolarizing noise or something like this, uh, or amplitude damping noise, um, it's weird. Uh, so in order to make code run well, it helps to know what the device is actually doing. So there's a couple of different kinds of errors you can have in the system. You know, you can have, some of the gates can just be miscalibrated. So your rotations are rotations by different angles than you think, but they're still unitary gates. And that's something where characterization just helps you straight off. If you know what the gate does rather than what it's supposed to do, uh, you can compile to get a better outcome. Uh, so you can kind of keep track of that and, and account for it. Um, if you have depolarizing noise or something like this, okay, that's problematic. But a lot of the time, the noise you see in the systems is non-Markovian and can be cancelled in some way. So there can be various ways of decoupling it um, or simply calibrating the system in a slightly different way to account for uh, some of the broadening that you see in the spectrum and stuff like this. Um, so the reason we do characterization at all is so that we can uh, feed back our characterization into, um, into the lower levels of our compiler. So that when we try to embed a circuit in a processor, we can take account of the quality of the gates. So not all, not all CZs or CNOTs are created equal. Some are better than others. Um, and if we do things like gate synthesis, some operations are less expensive than others in terms of our overall error budget. So we wanna be able to take this kind of thing into account. We also want to be able to account for unitary errors and things like this uh, to produce as good operations as we possibly can. Okay, uh, so this is an example uh, taken from the, uh, the new 32 qubit Rigetti chip, um, the Aspen 7. So if you, uh, if you try 
to do, um, if you try to do Ramsey experiments with your qubits, you find that, you know, you see, you see good, uh, good cosine curves that are decaying a bit for most of the qubits. Um, but you have this qubit that I've marked in, in red that is a little bit all over the place. So you don't have, uh, you don't have the good contrast. Um, it's not even clearly periodic. Uh, it's not really clear what's going on with that qubit. So you might think that's a bad qubit. There, there's just something wrong with it. We shouldn't use it at all. Um, but it turns out if you do a little bit more investigation, what you find out is that the qubit is actually very close to a pure state. So it's well initialized. Uh, and what's happening is just that the, the operations you're doing on the qubit itself uh, are not, it, it's not starting in the correct initial state and the operations are incorrect. So you're just doing it a sequence of operations to the qubits, but it's different than what you think it's going to be. So it gives you, it gives you this kind of nasty outcome. Um, however, if you know this, you can maybe try to take it into account. Uh, okay, so a more concrete example um, where I'll show you some results of actually mitigating the errors it is with stray couplings inside the device. Um, so in pretty much all of the superconducting processors, uh, what you find is that individual qubits are coupled to one another essentially with an Ising interaction that is not, a, that is not supposed to be there. Um, so the general effect of this is that when, when a particular qubit, uh, when the neighbors of it are in zero, the gap between its zero and one state has some particular value. Um, but if I excite its neighbors, and I don't necessarily mean its neighbors uh, physically uh, on the chip, when I excite qubits that it's interacting with, it has the effect of changing the, the level separation. Um, so we get some change in energy. So, so if they're both excited, I'm at one extreme. If they're, both, uh, if they're both in zero, I'm at a different extreme. Of course, there could be more than two neighbors. Um, this is just an example. And if, you know, if they're in some entangled state, uh, then there's some broadening uh, and we have, uh, we have an undefined gap between zero and one. Uh, and this, this is a problem. Uh, the reason it's a problem is because if I put a qubit into a plus state and I leave it alone, it will start to accrue phase, uh, depending on the state of its neighbors. So it turns out that if you do some investigation and you, uh, you try to run some tests on these devices, you find that a lot of the time, um, the whatever calibration process is done kind of assumes the neighbors to be in zero. So it assumes all of the other qubits in the device are in zero. Uh, and in that case, the, the, um, the X rotations you have, or the Y rotations you have, bring you from zero to one quite well. So they're, they're pretty close to on resonance. But, uh, but as you change the state of the other qubits, so if they're in, in, uh, in one state, for example, you're well off, and if they're in a superposition, you get quite a lot of decoherence. Uh, so to show you an example of this, uh, this is real data, again, taken from the latest Rigetti chip. Um, on the left, what we have is, uh, these are joint Ramsey experiments. So we have a single qubit prepared in a superposition of zero and one, uh, and we let it precess uh, for a certain amount of time. And then we, uh, we do a rotation again. So it should now be in the computational basis. Uh, it should be in zero if no phase accrued. Um, but you know, each of the qubits has some natural frequency. So some, some phrases accrued uh, and we put in place in these graphs, we put in place a, a time-dependent rotation anyway, so that we get a nice curve. Um, what you see, the two different curves you see in each of these plots, one is with a particular neighbor in zero, and the other is with that neighbor in one. So you see the, the frequency being shifted as you flip from zero to one. And this is basically a change in, in that gap. So 
in some cases, this is reasonably small on the order of a couple of kilohertz. In other cases, it gets up to about a 35 kilohertz coupling. Um, on the Rigetti chip, we've seen up to 150 on an IBM chip, uh, which is a bit weird, but um, these, things, these things exist. And it turns out, actually, you can start to map them out on the processor. So on the right-hand side, you see this. Um, we've been doing, uh, doing some tests between different pairs of qubits on a single processor uh, to build up a map of where the straight couplings are. Uh, as you see, a lot of the time, it's between nearest neighbors uh, on the lattice. Uh, the location of the vertices in this picture is where they are physically on the chip. Um, but there are some strong couplings between non-nearest neighbors. Okay. Uh, this is an example of doing some error mitigation techniques. So, um, so the red is uh, the red is the original qubit, um, and just the probability of the recovering the state as a function of time uh, in microseconds. So we prepare our state, we wait for some amount of time, and then we try to recover it. Um, but when we're doing this, all of the other qubits in the device are put in superposition. Uh, so it so it defases because of these stray couplings. There's a couple of ways we can deal with this. The first and most simplest is to update the frame. So I mentioned uh, I mentioned that when the devices are calibrated, they're usually it, it seems that most of them are calibrated so that between um, between the zero state and the one state, when all of the neighbors are zero. Is, uh, is pretty close to the pulses that are actually used. Um, but if the, if the neighbors are put in the one state, then that puts you at another extreme uh, and you get a, a big change in energy. Um, it turns out that a good strategy is to say, well, if I know all of the qubits are going to be part of computation, uh, they're probably entangled with other things. I don't know if they're gonna be in zero or one, but I can say it's probably equiprobable whether they're in zero or one, then it means I shouldn't set my, uh, I, I shouldn't assume that my energy gap is the extreme value I get by assuming, it, by measuring when everything else is in zero, but rather I should pick it in the middle of the range when everything's in zero or one. And if you do this, I guess you can see this, this green line uh, decays slower than the red line. Uh, and the reason for this, the dephasing is still there, but because you're putting it in the middle of the spread, what's happening is you're not picking up some coherent rotation as well. So you might see that the, the red line dips down slightly and starts to come back up. And that's because there is effectively a coherent rotation happening on top of the dephasing due to the fact that we're at one extreme of the range of uh, energy gaps rather than being in the center. Um, you can do you can do better again, uh, which is that you can try to uh, do spin echo. So you can let your qubit evolve for some amount of time, uh, and then you can flip it, let it evolve for the same amount of time again, and then undo your undo your flip. Uh, and if you do this, this decouples any Ising interactions from that particular qubit, and that gives you this this blue line on top. Uh, which you see is like decaying slower again. Uh, and this, this yellow line in the middle, uh, this is what happens when we, do, uh, when we do this decoupling, but we flip alternating sets of qubits. And the reason we do this is because it's all well and good to say you can use spin echo to, detect, uh, to decouple one qubit from the rest, but actually you want to decouple every qubit from every other qubit. And if you flip them all at the same time, all of those couplings stay the same. You decouple them from the environment, but not from each other. So, so uh, dividing them into two groups and deciding which to flip uh, based on which of those set it's in, uh, that yields this kind of yellow, uh, yellow line, and it's kind of the simplest, uh, the simplest step you could do. So this is qubit zero on their device as it was calibrated at the particular time uh, on the same uh, Aspen Seven chip. Um, but this was not the, the qubit for which the biggest uh, difference was seen. This is kind of a typical difference. This is an example of a qubit that does not behave well on the original device. 
So in this case, uh, the red line is the original, uh, the original effect of preparing a qubit in a plus state, uh, leaving it for some amount of time, and then uh, measuring it again, effectively doing a Hadamard and measuring it. So I guess as you can see, um, it, it dips below 50% very, very quickly, but actually it comes back up. And this is because, uh, this is because it's picking up a coherent Z rotation, which it shouldn't be. Um, but it's the effect of the Ising coupling to other, uh, other systems on the device. Um, if, you know, the frame update gives you the green line, so that already gives you a huge improvement, uh, at least, you know, before you get to around 30 or 40 uh, microseconds. Um, but decoupling does much better again. So you can see the, but the yellow and the blue lines are, are well above either of these. And if you were to look at the time it takes to get from say 70% uh, chance of recovering the state, um, there's a huge difference between the original strategy and uh, between the original um, and what happens if you employ either of the decoupling strategies. So it really changes the lifetime of that qubit. Excuse me, Joe. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that, so you, you're, you, you believe that this is the result of residual icing couplings on the chip. Um, are you able to, um, have you, have you been able to make any measurements to prove that it is an icing coupling or, or is it, because uh, I imagine there are quite a lot of different types of complex couplings that might produce similar effects oh, in some complicated sure. way. Um, sure. So, uh, it, okay. So I, I mean, when I say icing, I mean, it's a ZZ coupling. Um, so I, I should be clear about that. Uh, I'm not referring to any particular mechanism for it. Uh, the, perhaps the most obvious way of seeing this, and, and yes, we've done tomography. Uh, we've done pairwise tomography between qubits uh, for different amounts of time. So we see how each right. of the, uh, how each of the, um, each of the terms in the density matrix changes with time. Uh, and yeah, it, a, a big chunk of this is just a ZZ uh, mm -hmm. term. Um, and actually you can, see this if I go back to this, um, it's not, it, it's between many pairs, right? So if I focus on qubit 14, there's contributions from qubit one, qubit 15 and qubit 13. So if I look just at qubits 15 and 14, for example, I will see quite a strong ZZ coupling, but I'll also see dephasing. Um, and part of that dephasing is caused by all sorts of things, but part of it is caused by the coupling to qubit 13 and part of it's caused by the coupling to qubit one, for example. All right, thanks. Um, and that's why you do better uh, than you expect. Actually, it turns out that if you plot these entries with time, uh, you see that the dephasing is non-Markovian, um, so that it falls off more slowly than you would expect initially, and then picks up speed. Um, and that's a, that's a pretty clear sign that it's some kind of coherent coupling that's going on. Um, of course, there is relaxation going on at the same time and you know other other forms of error but this is a fairly significant one um the other reason you can kind of tell it's sizing is because uh when you do simple spin echo so you just flip a qubit halfway through and then flip it back it it does a very good job of cancelling that coupling so uh these these are the these are the joint Ramsey with and without a spin echo midway through the, uh, the exposure time. So on the left is uncorrected, on the right is, is corrected with a single spin flap. And I guess you can see the, um, the, the straight coupling uh, drops off very, very quickly. All right, thanks. Okay, so this is all pretty simple stuff. Um, I think perhaps the most interesting thing we've been playing around with is this problem of, uh, of trying to measure where all the straight couplings are in a device. Um, it seems very straightforward to say, oh, why don't you just decouple everything? But the problem is that I can't, uh, if I run the same de decoupling sequence on every qubit, uh, it won't decouple them from one another, it will decouple them from the environment. Um, so if I wanna decouple them from one another, I need to be doing different sequences on each qubit. Um, but the gates take quite a long time compared to the coherence length. Uh, 
sorry, compared to the um, compared to T two. So uh, so what what we need is to kind of decouple, but with not very many gates. Uh, and if we want to do this, it's very helpful to know what qubits are coupled to what other qubits. Now, it seems to make a lot of sense to just say, well, why don't we just do joint Ramsey experiments between every pair of qubits? However, when you work out how long that takes on a real device to get enough statistics, you find that you need to run continuously for like more than a day. Um, the problem with this is that these parameters change, they drift with time. So by the time you're finished, uh, your measurements are no good anymore. So really, if you want this to be useful, you need to be able to take all of the measurements within about half an hour. Uh, and then update your parameters on the device, update the, the frames for each qubit, uh, as well as you know, designing your decoupling pulse sequence, you know, implement that for a couple of hours and then recalibrate again. Uh, so in order to do this, you don't have the time to do pairwise measurements. Um, so what we've been working at is basically ways of uh, exciting all of the qubits, uh, exposing them for varying amounts of time, uh, to the natural Hamiltonian of the system, and then measuring them, and then trying to back out of that the pairwise couplings between all of the qubits. Um, so it turns out what would have taken many thousand runs before, we can get down to something like seven runs uh, on this chip, which is pretty, uh, pretty handy. But a side effect we've noticed, at least on the Rigetti systems, is that it seems to take longer to run on longer chips um, because of some compile that's happening right before it's run. Uh, and the effect is that, you know, it's slower on large chips to run the same number of shots than it is on smaller chips or on a sub lattice. Um, and so we're not yet at the speed we want to be, which is why this coupling graph is a bit noisy. Um, it's also, I, I've uh, left out couplings between unit cells just so you can actually see it here. Um, but this is, uh, this is from the latest chip, trying to essentially map all of the couplings in, uh, in a couple of shots. Okay, I'll skip on from the, the lowest level stuff uh, and talk about low level programming. Let's start. So basically what we've been doing on this front is to build up uh, our lowest level programming language, which we call hydrogen. It is, uh, you know, it's a gate level language similar to all other gate level languages in that you, you know, you specify the operation you want to do, you specify the hardware address you want to do it on, or you, um, you assign a qubit dynamically. So that's what the, the qubit operation is doing at the top. Um, and then you, uh, yeah, you specify parameters for, for example, in our Z gate, and then you, you know, you try to compile this to something that fits to hardware by moving the qubits around if you haven't specified a hardware address to try to find the best location to put them in so that you uh, minimize the number of swaps that need to be done uh, within the computation, the amount of bridging. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting about this is that it's all structured. Uh, it, it's all generated from a, a structured text file. So there is nothing in the language that is pre-written. This isn't particularly about qubits. Um, I have qubit defined as a gate. Uh, I have h defined as a gate in a separate text file, and I can edit this text file to add new operations. Anyone can add any operations they want simply by adding the Krauss operators. So for example, the top one here is uh, C not gate. So you give it a name first, you specify the dimensions in, so the the number of dimensions of the subset systems. So uh, two space two means that the first subsystem is of dimension two and the second subsystem is of dimension two. So if I wanted to define a gate that interacted a qubit with a qtrip, for example, uh, you could just directly write that in by writing in the appropriate Krauss operator. Um, it supports general POVMs, so you can write out uh, whatever set of Krauss operators you want. Uh, with corresponding classical outputs. So this is, uh, this is in the second one, for example, in the, the measurement one. And it has support for parameterized gates um, where the Krauss operators are given basically by function handles. So it just calls some function that generates the Krauss operator on the fly for whatever parameter you have. Okay, 
Um, the reason for, part of the reason for doing this is so that we can easily change between languages or between instruction sets, I should say. So if you're working with a particular device, the set of natural gates for that device um, varies. Um, so, you know, uh, ion traps using Melmer Sorensen gates uh, are different than cross resonance gates and superconducting qubits that are different than, you know, KLM gates or whatever in, in optical systems. Um, so the, the idea here is basically that you can define a different language file. So that's the, the gray side here for each of the different uh, each of the different instruction sets that you're working with. Um, and in principle, you can have uh, the language one that you work with. So you specify uh, like the, this simple line one that we use. Uh, so this is kind of the standard set of gates that you see in Nielsen and Chang for the most part, because um, it's nice to work with. And then uh, you can specify a second set that comes from your device and you the idea is that we can use the calibration techniques to fill in, you know, what the cross operators are for each operation that's available on the device and so on. So that instead of having the cross operator associated with the ideal operation uh, at the physical level, we, we work out also um, what's happening physically within the device. So you have one language, one set of instructions that refers to the ideal ones. So to your intent, when I do a C not, this is what I want. However, when I call the C not instruction on my processor, it does something different. Uh, and the reason for, for having these different instruction sets, the, the ability to specify different instruction sets, um, partly is so that you can explore different types of processors, uh, not just qubits. You can extend to other things. You can add in new types of gates that, that you invent or that are available in new hardware and so on, but also so that you can convert between the instruction sets using gate synthesis. So you, uh, you have your ideal gates that you want to do, and you've got what the processor actually does when you call certain instructions. And so you want to convert from, you know, some sequence of your ideal gates to some sequence of, uh, some sequence of instructions on the processor that yields the same outcome or as close to high, sorry, as high fidelity uh, an outcome as possible to your original uh, noise-free instructions. Um, it also is to allow you to do things like going from, you know, these parameterized RZs to, you know, to like the Hadamard T C not gate set, where it's only approximately universal and you need to implement Solovay could have um, that kind of thing. So, you know, there's not very much new in this, um, but the, the reason I bring it up is that, you know, being able to support Different, uh, different gates, uh, being able to define them just in structured text file uh, makes it quite useful for being able to, uh, for making it possible to, to work with different instruction sets and to convert between the two and so on. Um, okay, the next level up uh, we call helium. Basically it's quantum basic. Um, you can see an example of it here on the left. Um, so it has the same instructions as a gate level language, but they're augmented with conditionals. If, uh, for example, uh, you can do repetitions, uh, so you can repeat until a particular condition is met. Um, I should say this, this condition being met means that a classical measurement outcome yields a particular result. Uh, and then you can do subroutines. You can also do uh, basically like simple for loops. Um, so we call them increment loops um, because they just increment a variable from, uh, from one to some particular value. So here on the left, you have increment K to eight. So first time through the loop, K will have uh, value one, then two, then three, then four, up to eight. So this is very simple. But what's important about this is that each of the gate level language, this language, and the next language up are all entirely focused on the quantum processor and its control hardware. They're not at all focused on your computer. Nothing runs on your computer. So this isn't like, uh, this isn't like Cusquid or Pico where you're running for loops 
in Python to construct a circuit. Um, these are these are intended. This is all focused on stuff that should happen on the processor. Now we don't do the loops on the processor. We unroll them. Um, and you could say that's not very different, but the reason to do this and structure it this way is because it allows us to do optimization within loops. So if I have a loop that's gonna be called very many times, it allows us to call uh, optimization uh, subroutine to run on this, uh, on, the, you know, on the current program I have to try to optimize what's going on within a loop. So I don't have to do it very many times, uh, you know, each time, that I would have entered the loop. I can do it a single time. And again, this is so that if we're building something that has a lot of gates, uh, we don't need to, we don't need to um, unroll the whole thing and then try to optimize that massive circuit. Instead, we can, we can look just within, within uh, conditional blocks, just within repeat loops, within, uh, within these increment loops and so on, and optimize within them uh, before unrolling, for example. Um, the repeat until instruction is not supported by uh, most of the systems currently uh, publicly accessible. Um, in order to implement it, you need to be able to do stuff essentially on the control hardware as well. Um, so in principle, this allows you to write programs that have uh, an indefinite runtime. So they don't necessarily terminate after 27 gates or something like that. They may run for longer depending on measurement outcomes. Um, okay, so this is a very crude example of uh, some of the optimization subroutines in action. And just if you implement a QFT, uh, you have an incrementer and then inverse QFT throw at the circuit optimization subroutines. You end up, you know, going from 53 gates to three gates. This is just a, a proof that it works. It's currently slow uh, and we're currently improving these. So I'm not gonna show you benchmarks against anything because none of this is benchmarked yet. Um, so the optimization stuff is, uh, is still work in progress. Um, but we think we can do some interesting stuff there, but it's still, there's still a lot to be done on that front. Um, another thing that this allows you to do, um, by defining subroutines, um, it's quite useful to define measurement subroutines, for example. So if you're doing single qubit experiments, for example, or two qubit experiments, something like this, um, there's a whole load of extra qubits on the chip uh, for many of these chips. Or, or I, I mean, both of these were superconducting chips, but I guess you could also be working on an ion trap or in something else. Um, you know, one of the things we tried uh, is what happens if I try to make use of some of these ancillas when I do measurement. So instead of measuring a qubit, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a fan out from the qubit with C naughts uh, onto some ancilla qubits. And then I'm going to measure those ancilla qubits together with the qubit that I wanted to measure. Um, and I'm either going to use error detection by seeing do they all give the same result, or I'm going to use uh, error correction and do a majority vote. So the top one here is results from uh, running on one of the older Rigetti chips, the Aspen 4. Um, the particular qubit we tried it on had an unencoded error rate of 9%. So, you know, that's pretty, you know, it's reasonably high measurement error. Um, C naughts also have high, have high error, but some of the errors that occur are kind of dephasing errors on the control qubit, for example, that do not affect your measurement outcome because they, the, that dephasing will ultimately commute with the measurement of that qubit. Uh, so you end up getting away with uh, being able to fan out a couple of times. So on the Rigetti device, we, uh, we made one pseudocopy uh, and just compared the results. So if we get zero, zero, or if we get one, one, we compare that to uh, what state that qubit was actually in. Uh, and we go down from 9% uh, on average to 3% on average with post-selection. And if we use two ancillas, we get down to 2% uh, with post-selection. Uh, so I guess you can see why this is maybe kind of a handy subroutine to have, to be able to, um, like every time, you, every time you run your experiment, to be able to do just more robust measurements and not have to think about it, not have to implement the fan out every time just to be able to say, you know, call the measurement subroutine. 
Uh, similarly, tried the same thing with uh, IBM QX4. Uh, the particular qubit on the particular day we tried, unencoded error rate was 19% uh, using two ancillas uh, and using majority vote error correction. So there's no discarding of results. There's no post-selection in this. Uh, we get from 19 down to 12, and then four ancillas, uh, we get down to 10%. I guess you can see there's kind of a, a law of uh, diminishing returns here, because ultimately, if we do enough C knots, we end up pushing up the error rate rather than suppressing it. Um, but you can get, you know, you can get at least a factor of two on most of these systems, and in some cases, more. Um, okay, so I'll move on to the highest level quantum language we've been working on. Um, this is basically, you know, it still has access to the to the gate level commands, but it allows you to define functions, structs, uh, things like this. It also allows you to do breakable loops. So this isn't something that you can unroll. So if I have a for loop in it, but if some condition is met, I call break, then it's impossible for me to tell ahead of time uh, how long, how many times I need to go through that for loop. Now, the lower level language, the Helium language, that supports monitored loops. So if I'm making a measurement and the measurement is a particular value, I can break out of a loop. But in this case, I may want to be able to coherently break out of the loop, meaning that um, I run, I go through a loop some number of times, I exit that loop, I go into another loop some number of times, I come out of that loop, and then it gets measured at the end. Uh, so I know the total time it ran, but I don't necessarily know how many times it went through each loop. So I can have a superposition of different numbers of, uh, of times through the loop, through each loop, as long as the total runtime is, is fixed. Um, so this is pretty high level. You need to construct a lot of the uh, mechanics for doing this um, as quantum circuits where you kind of construct a, a pointer, an instruction pointer for your system um, within the quantum processor and so on. Uh, and it supports things like pointers. Um, and I'll show you why this is, is super useful. Um, I'm not gonna focus on this. There's still quite a lot of this that's in flux. Um, but one thing we've implemented is, uh, is this kind of, um, support. So instead of passing uh, the RZ command or any other parameters gate, um, uh, a classical parameter, like some angle or something like this, instead I can pass it uh, an address range uh, or a set of addresses. And what it will do from that is it will look at the classical, it will look at the, um, the value stored in those addresses and implement a rotation based on that, or implement that as the parameter in your gate. Um, so for example, in this case, you do a Z rotation by an angle specified by qubits A and B, and you do the Z rotation on qubit C. Um, it turns out this is quite a lot of gates. It's a, it's a long thing to do. Um, if anyone has ever tried implementing the HHL algorithm, this is kind of a key step in it, and it's really, really frustrating when you try to implement it. Um, because you need to work out how to do this. Uh, you need to work out this gate sequence and it's, it's really a pain. Um, we can now do this on the fly for any gate. So you give me a MATLAB function, for example, specifying the Krauss operators for a particular gate. Um, well, let's say it's a unitary gate. Uh, and you give me the range for which the parameter should take on and the number of qubits that you want to be able to read. Um, so basically as, as passed by this, um, this address, uh, this set of addresses, uh, then, then we can generate automatically the circuit that implements that controlled rotation. Um, the other reason to go to this kind of high level programming languages is to, uh, is to allow you to start to implement quantum data structures. And by that, I mean, uh, implement data types in a way that maybe uses quantum states to store them or quantum algorithms to manipulate them um, and try to get better trade-offs than you can classically. So there's a lot of focus in the community on algorithms, but not so much on data structures and, and uh, implementing data types. Um, but it turns out that you can 
you can find representations, uh, you can find ways of implementing, um, implementing different data types, different abstract data types uh, using quantum mechanics that outperform any possible classical, uh, any possible classical implementation. So this may sound a little bit strange. Uh, you know, if I'm completely free to choose a, the data, the way the data is structured, um, the way things are implemented, the algorithms that are used to manipulate it, then any property of any manipulation or any property of any system, I can always have be, uh, you know, have the complexity for, for either reading that or manipulating that be big O of one. Because I just have a data structure where I append the instruction that says, and now I read the set, you know, and now I apply this manipulation, if it's just a manipulation of the data structure, or I have a data structure where it always stores results to, you know, to all possible things I may want to know about it. So I just need to read that. Um, the thing that you have though, is you have these dichotomies where you can't have two different things necessarily be fast. So for example, uh, this is a, quite an old example that we, we published uh, before starting the company, but gave us some motivation uh, in terms of what we're doing at Horizon, is, uh, is that you can just try the simplest possible data structure. Um, so the simplest thing you can possibly do is try to store vectors as state vectors, and that's kind of the basis of all of the HHL type stuff. Um, but if you go one step beyond that, what's the next most obvious thing you can try to do? Well, why don't we, uh, why don't we try to store graphs as graph states? Um, turns out if you do this, you, um, you get a data type that basically allows you things like local edge complementation, uh, meaning this kind of thing I've drawn in the picture on the top where for a particular vertex, if there is no edge between its neighbors, you draw one. And if there is an edge, you get rid of it. Uh, so you can do that around uh, individual vertices in big O of one. You can do inter, sorry, intrasect uh, edge complementation. So if I pick a subset of vertices, I can complement all of the edges between them. Uh, again, uh, in this is in linear time, uh, you know, in most of the common classical graph representations, it would be, uh, it would be quadratic time. Um, but you can cook up a classical data structure that lets you do it in big O of one if you want, by just appending the instruction, uh, you know, uh, that complements them. So you just, you know, it's literally just the program, that's the data structure. Uh, you can do interset uh, edge complementation. So if I have two different sets, I can complement all the edges between them. Uh, again, in, um, again, in linear time, you can do graph comparison. Uh, so compare two graphs with constant probability of success, uh, independent of the graph size. Um, again, in linear time, uh, you can do vertex comparison uh, in big O of one. You can do automorphism testing. So if I want to test is something a particular uh, is some particular operation an automorphism on the graph. Again, you can do that with constant success probability uh, in the time it implement, it takes you to implement the automorphism. Um, and then you can, actually it turns out if you have a linear number of copies of these, you have uh, two N copies of these, you can read them out. Uh, you can read it out classically, what the, what the graph is. Um, takes, it takes only a uh, big O of N, uh, where N is the number of vertices. Uh, qubits to store. So it, it takes less, uh, less qubits than you require to store the adjacency matrix, which is why you need a linear number of copies to be able to recover it. Um, but what's interesting about this is that no classical data structure can match its performance for certain pairs of operations. So it has vertex comparison in big O of one and local edge complementation in big O of one. Um, which you can't do. I guess you can see that classically you can come up with a data structure that allows either one of these to happen in big O of one, but you can prove that there is no classical data structure that allows you to do that, um, to do that in big O of one. And, you know, actually the average is going to be linear either way. If you average the complexity of the comparison 
with the complexity of the local edge complementation, you know, best you can do classically is big O of n. Uh, so this this gives some motivation to like why we want to be able to support structs and uh, and ultimately uh, build up classes so that we can implement different kinds of uh, abstract data types using quantum mechanics rather than classically. And this leads directly into the high level uh, stuff. Um, so basically, this is a subset of MATLAB and Octave that we're using. Um, we're expanding it a little bit, but you know, on the left there, you can see vanilla MATLAB code. Um, we don't support all of the features in MATLAB by any stretch of the imagination, um, but this is where we currently are. Um, so the idea is that you just take, you just write some classical code to do your problem, it, you know, to, to solve the problem you want to do. Um, actually, this is written as a script, but ultimately it will only be for functions uh, because we want to know what the output is so that we can tell, uh, we can tell what, what are side effects that we don't need to care about from what is the, the real uh, output that we should care about. Um, so we have this classical code and basically what we want to do is get to the stage where we can turn this into uh, some set of quantum gates that accomplishes the same task, but with much less, uh, hopefully much less operations. So how do we approach this? Um, well, basically there's two things that make your code slow. Um, there's what I'll call explicit complexity. And by that, I mean things you have written in as the programmer that you've written into your code that are necessarily slow. So you go through a loop a million times. Well, it's going to take a million times, however long it takes to do whatever is inside that loop. There's just no, no getting around that because you've told the computer to do something a million times. Um, or you do uh, some kind of recursive algorithm and you, you know, you keep, you keep calling a function within a function within a function. Uh, and that just goes through however many levels of recursion it needs to go through until it gets, uh, you know, on, until it, it uh, until the recursion ends. Um, and so this is you, the programmer, having created a large number of instructions from a relatively small amount of code. The other kinds of places where you get, I mean, we can all basically assume that your code is relatively short. So I don't know how many lines of code you would program if you sat down to program in a, a given day. Uh, apparently it's a, about 10 lines of code per day for, uh, for commercial software. Um, and you know, once you take into account all of the, um, all of the rewrites and all of that kind of thing. Uh, but, uh, you know, ultimately how long is the code? It's not going to be, it's not going to be billions and trillions of lines, right? Um, you know, major software products are in the millions of lines. Uh, but, you know, for a lot of scientific stuff, we're talking about significantly less code, you know, maybe thousands of lines of code or something like that might be typical for, uh, to compute something of interest. Um, the other thing that generates huge amounts of, of complexity for you is just the implicit cost of operations. So, uh, if, for example, I am in MATLAB, I, uh, I have two matrices defined and I, multi I multiply them together. Um, you know, me writing down a line of code to multiply them together, it's just one line of code, but the complexity of that scales, you know, effectively with the cube of the, of the size of the matrix. Um, I would say, uh, I would say that it's the matrix multiplication constant, but we all know it's not. Um, most ways these things are implemented are cubic time. Uh, or close to cubic time, um, just because the the better complexity scalings, you know, have huge prefactors for the most part. Um, so our approach is basically with this stuff that's causing explicit complexity to try to break it down to refactor the code in a way that no longer has that explicit complexity to push it into implicit complexity. And then to take care of the implicit complexity, essentially by using better data types. 
uh, by using better implementations of data types, I should say, uh, and by using quantum algorithms for some of the, uh, to take care of some of the functions that you've caused by pushing explicit complexity into implicit complexity. Um, so I'm going to show you an example of that. This is, uh, this is generated from code we have running at the moment, um, although of course it doesn't present results as, uh, as prettily as I'll show them in a slide, um, but this is real output from a compiler. So this is just uh, some simple bit of MATLAB code. Um, the first thing recursively defines some, uh, some matrix, the uh, ijth entry of matrix. Um, there's, uh, there's some constant set, then there's a loop that, uh, that finds the, um, the hottest location in this, uh, this heat map matrix that was defined. And then there's another loop that breaks out of it uh, the first time you move along the diagonal uh, in this array uh, until the value on the diagonal exceeds five, right? And then you, you break out of that loop. Um, so we throw this at our compiler. Uh, first thing it does, is it pulls apart loops to try to simplify them. So this is this is what happens between the input code, uh, you know, and the the next step of the compiler. It breaks apart complex loops to try to make them all simpler loops. This is the exact opposite of what happens if you are uh, if you're building an optimizing compiler for classical computing. You usually want to push small loops together so that you have less branches. Uh, you've less branch conditions so that your chance of um, your chance of uh, making an incorrect branch prediction uh, is is lower um, okay so that's uh, first thing that happens is loops are pulled apart there's also some uh, some reordering of um, of comparisons in if statements and things like this uh, and then the next thing that happens is that loops get classified so the first loop, uh, that's a special kind of loop, right? It, what it's doing is it's recursively defining uh, the ijth entry of, of a matrix. Um, and the way we represent matrices is, uh, you know, we want to be able to make use of HHL where possible. So what we want to do is store our matrix, not with uh, an explicit store of each of the values of the matrix, of each of the values of the matrix, but rather with an oracle that gives me that if I give it ij, it gives me the ijth element. So I want to compute a function. Instead of having this for loop, I want to produce a function that given ij gives me the ijth entry of this heat map. Um, so I can do that, it turns out, without ever going through these for loops. Um, I can find a kind of closed form uh, expression for this to compute, uh, to compute what goes on within, to, to compute the ijth uh, entry of the heat map um, without having to go through this recursion by realizing that there's a kind of closed form way of solving this. Um, the next thing, uh, it's a, again, there's a very simple uh, relation here for the, um, for the second loop that I have in red uh, and it's analytically solved. So it just happens to be a type of loop that we can analytically solve. The next one turns out is a max value search. So we're looking for an extremal value. Um, and this is, it, this comes up all the time actually in real code. Uh, and then we have something, something that's a sequential search. So none of these are Grover search uh, straight off, but you can construct the max value search and you can construct the sequential search um, using amplitude amplification. The stuff that's analytically solved and the definition because of the data type we're using for matrices, um, these become uh, these become much faster. So these only take log time uh, instead of uh, taking, you know, in the case of the first loop, because you go through it twice, it, it would take, uh, you know, 9998 squared. Uh, this is taking kind of the log of 9998. Uh, second one, instead of taking 10,000 steps, you know, you're taking kind of the log of that. Uh, and then the two searches, you get quadratic speed ups for. Um, so the net result is that you end up with a quantum algorithm uh, and then a, a quantum circuit that has effectively 300,000 times fewer operations. Now, this is assuming that the system is noiseless. This isn't including uh, full tolerant overhead. Uh, we will 
at some point be able to implement uh, fault tolerant encoding and so on, but that's not implemented yet and that's still some time off for us. Um, but this is just at an algorithmic level, being able to go from classical code to, uh, to a, quantum, uh, a quantum algorithm that accomplishes the same thing um, with less operations. Now, does this work on everything? No. You know, if you were computing parity, there's already a really good classical algorithm to compute parity. Uh, it, you know, there's not a better quantum one. There's certainly cases where we won't be able to speed stuff up. The other thing you could say is, well, is this the best classical code you could get? And the answer is probably no. But, you know, I, I identified two things. Well, I identified something there that could be, sorry, I identified something here that could be analytically solved. Uh, you know, a, a classical compiler could do that. Um, but actually the bit that was analytically solved was caused by uh, breaking a piece off of for loop um, and it just created more complexity for myself rather than less. Uh, so the fact that it's solved didn't really help anything. Um, but, you know, sure. Maybe, uh, you know, if the coder had written stuff in a different way, they could have come up with a better classical algorithm. But that's not the point of comparison. The point of comparison is uh, real code to real code. Uh, so someone writes some code. Can you convert it to code that takes significantly less time than it would if compiled and run on a classical computer? So that's it. Um, thanks for taking the time to listen. If any of you are interested in what we're doing, want to find out more, or if you're uh, applying for postdocs or things like this, and you're considering industry, you can drop us an email uh, at hello at horizonquantum.com um, or at my first name at horizonquantum.com if you want to get me directly. Thanks very much. Hey. <laughs> Thanks very much for your talk, Joe. It was, I mean, I found it extremely interesting. Um, does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask Joe? Yeah. So with the, the last stuff you talked about in regards to the, the code that will come and sort of maybe quantum, quantumify um, classical code, is that all running? Is, I mean, could I put it in anything now or it's not quite finished yet? Oh, so I mean, it only supports a subset of MATLAB. So, yeah, I mean, in some ways, like it will never be finished in that we will always strive to improve it. And as new techniques are discovered to try to, you know, implement, uh, implement better data structures and implement, uh, you know, catch different kinds of programming structure that, um, may be implemented that could be accelerated in a quantum way that we aren't yet aware of, that we're not catching. Um, but what I've shown you works, and it's not because of the particular piece of code that we put in. Um, the, I mean, these are literally the outputs of, uh, of the parser. Um, but, uh, and yeah, so this works for other MATLAB code containing, you know, a similar set of instructions. Now, obviously, we don't support things like plot. And, uh -huh. you know, we don't support the symbolic toolbox. So there's plenty of things in base level MATLAB that we don't support. Um, but we're, we're building up from there. Uh, at the moment, not everything works together. So this will do the analysis. You know, we have a piece of code that will do the analysis that I've shown at the start, but this isn't connected all the way down. So we, I mean, we have the quantum algorithms and everything, but not everything is fully implemented all the way down yet. We're still building that. And it's gonna be a while before we're finished. Like there's a lot that we have to, there, there's a lot of parts to this. Um, so getting, you know, right down, uh, the whole way down to the gate level and then to the error mitigation and all of that, that's just gonna take, that's gonna take us more time. Um, so the, the first thing that will be, uh, that will open up publicly will be the, the first two levels, uh, from helium. That's the basic like language on down, uh, and, you know, with characterization. Um, and then after that, we will, uh, we'll expand, we'll add in this high level stuff. 
and then ultimately we aim to be able to incorporate fault tolerant stuff as well um, but we're a long way off being able to do that at the moment cool thanks hi Derek. um i wanted to ask um about you made this comment at the end how of course there are going to be kept some classical algorithms that you're not going to be able to speed up with your compiler um sure. is the plan ultimately that um your compiler will basically take the code that's written and send the things that can be done efficiently on the classical machine off to the classical processor and then send the things that can be sped up to a quantum subprocessor? Yeah. So ultimately what we want to be able to do is to compile function by function. So uh, to kind of build up a, a tree of things that depend on, on one another uh, and figure out within that tree up to what level should we put on what quantum processor? So if we have a number of different quantum processors available to us, how can we split tasks between them? Which ones are best suited for which, uh, for which piece? And which pieces are not sped up uh, quantum mechanically and should just be done classically? And even of those, which should be pushed off to GPUs versus done on a CPU? Um, you know, and that depends on like what parallelize as well, for example. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, that's ultimately uh, ultimately our goal, but we're some way off doing that at the moment. We're mostly doing, we're mostly focused on pure quantum stuff. So stuff that just goes on a processor. Do um, you imagine a situation where, um, as you uh, uh, are compiling down onto a quantum device, depending on the specific date set, for example, at the bottom of that quantum processor? Um, you may or may not get a speed up. So if you, if certain processes might see a speed up uh, for a particular gate set, but another processor that has a different gate set can't see a, the same speed up? Yeah, sure. Uh, for sure. I mean, that will be the case though for stuff that aren't really dramatic speed ups. Right. Okay. Um, and full tolerance might, the overhead from full tolerance might kill that um, anyway. But, uh, but yeah, um, sure. Uh, for sure, there's there's some things that nearest neighbor architectures just won't be able to do as fast as something that is connected in a different way. I mean, right. I know everyone says it talks about you know ion traps you can have fully connected or something, but I'm not sure that any of us really believe that, right? You know, at some point, um, it's just that the connectivity graph beyond a certain size doesn't necessarily need to be planar. And particularly with things like optics, right? You, you know that every qubit is probably only going to be able to interact with a constant number of other qubits, but you can pretty much place them wherever you want. Um, so you can come up with interaction graphs that are, you know, much better suited to long range communication while still having a constant degree in terms of the number of neighbors of each qubit, for example, no. uh, than you can in planar, uh, kind of planar graphs. Um, so yeah, for sure, uh, for sure that's the case. Uh, it's definitely the case with uh, also with QRAM type stuff, right? Uh, so you know one of the things that you know that's going on in the background if you do HHL type things for uh, matrix data structures, for example, or tensor data structures, is you know a lot of the stuff that's in the literature requires QRAM, and you don't have QRAM. Maybe you will in the future, but you don't have it now. So you need to you need to figure out: Do I still get an advantage if I try to synthesize QRAM uh, with with the instructions I have available to me on the device? Um, you know, I can build a, like I can build a, an address register and a return register out of gates within my device, right? So I can assign some number of qubits to be like the the, um, the pointer register that points to an address in memory mm -hmm. and another to be its return. And then I can construct a, a sequence out of a, a bunch of Fredkin gates or something like that, that will do what QRAM is supposed to do. Um, but well, for a start, noise is you know, likely to kill you, uh, at least at this stage. But also you have the issue of, well, you know, if it's a linear chain, then there's linear overhead. 
Now, if I have something that's not a linear chain, if I have something that's, uh, you know, like a square grid or something, square lattice, uh, then actually maybe I can get a speed up. Maybe it's not going to be the, the uh, you know, the exponential speed up that I get from some of the HHL type algorithms, but maybe it's like a square root speed up, uh, speed up because I'm encountering a square root overhead for my uh, QRAM type queries rather than them being big O of one or being logarithmic time. Uh, I'm, I'm taking square root of n to make them, but square root of n is still less than linear. And maybe if I have a treaty array, I can get down to, you know, cubic root of n or whatever. Uh, and it really depends on the connectivity, uh, the connectivity between qubits. Right. And right. that's something Thanks. we only know when we know the device. Great. Thanks. But I don't wanna, I don't wanna pretend that all of that's implemented. Um, you know, these are things, some, you know, the QRAM type stuff. A big to-do list. That's on the roadmap. Yeah, I mean, you've seen the team slide. There's not a huge number of us. Um, and that includes some people that are not coding. So, um, uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, big to-do list. Um, we're now hiring um, a bunch more people. So if anyone is seeing this and is interested in this kind of thing, by all means, drop me an email um, because there's still a lot to do. Uh, and even when we get all this done, then we will, you know, see how much further we can push it. You know, what else can, what else can we do? What other algorithms, uh, techniques can we build in? What kinds of programming structures can be sped up that we're not catching? Uh, you know, what else can we do with this kind of approach? And there, okay, there's cool. a whole, there's a huge amount about fault tolerance that like is just a, a big gaping hole that we need to address. Um, fortunately, uh, Ben is, uh, you know, comes from a fault tolerance background. So that's, that's pretty useful, but like we still have a lot that needs to be done in that, in that realm, but we haven't really touched that much. Great. Thanks very much. Hi, Joe. Um, uh, I, I do. I guess a high level question, maybe, maybe um, this is um, in your material online or you, you've said this, but are, are you building, are you building tools for, um, for researchers? I mean, is, is or for a company, other companies building quantum computers or, uh, and then I guess a related question is, is this, is this done in the open or is this a product that one would have to purchase? Um, yeah. Can other people so, get involved that aren't employees of your company, that sort of thing? Sure. So, um, okay. So let me answer the first question first. No, this is not open source. Uh, yes, it will be a commercial product. Um, you know, I now no longer have an academic job. I work in a company. Um, and that company ultimately needs to make money in some way. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, it's going to be a commercial software product, uh, which is why I have been a bit hesitant about going into some of the details of exactly how certain things are done, um, because not all of these techniques will ever necessarily uh, be, be publicly available. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, or at least not, not for a while. So, you know, uh, exactly how some of the calculations are done and things like that will will likely not be made public uh, in the near future. Um, but obviously you, you get the output, you, the, you can confirm the output does what it's supposed to do. Um, let's see, so uh, yeah, in terms of, in terms of users, um, Basically, the, the view of this, the reason that we have different languages for each, uh, each of the levels of the compiler is essentially because of different use cases. Um, so the gate level language is just because we need a gate level language because everything needs a gate level language. Uh, and why not use, you know, why not use uh, Quasm and Quiskit? Why not use uh, Quill and PyQuill? Why not use Q sharp? Why not use whatever? Um, and the reason we uh, the reason we use our own one is so that we can expand it in exactly the way we want, um, and also because we've had very inconsistent results with 
with compiling stuff with some of the lower level languages. So that's, that's why we're kind of taking care of gate level stuff as well. Um, so basically from helium, helium and hydrogen, uh, that we expect to be of most use uh, to people that do quantum stuff, right? People in the community. Um, although this isn't ultimately our target market and it's not likely to be particularly expensive uh, if there's gonna be any cost involved at all for, for academic market. Um, but, uh, yeah, so th there's a couple of, there's a couple of different use cases, right? So if you're, if you want to do quantum experiments, you want to, you want to play around with circuits, try different things on processors and so on, the kind of the low level, well, the gate level language, you know, is just like Wasm or, or Quill or something like that, uh, in that, you know, you specify gates, you can try stuff on processors, whatnot. Um, the, the next level up, the low level one, uh, the kind of interesting use case of this is that it allows for, for good optimization, allows you to define subroutines and stuff like this. So it's kind of a more powerful uh, language for this kind of low level programming. So if you wanna do characterization type experiments on the devices, if you want to uh, try out simple quantum algorithms, if you wanna do variational algorithms, that kind of thing, all of that uh, is kind of the helium level, down to gate level, that is, you know, something we expect people that are more on the quantum side to be to be interested in. Um, the the gate level to hardware level stuff, this is more aimed at specific uh, hardware characterization and things like that. So if you're just going from kind of hydrogen to, to the hardware level and using the characterization subroutines, um, this is something that is more aimed at hardware companies, right? Uh, and then the higher level, Kind of brilliant this is aimed more towards quantum algorithms people so you know you're you're playing around with different kinds of algorithms data structures uh you want to be able to implement them you want to be able to see how they perform kind of resource counting things like this maybe you want to run them in simulation um i don't know how many of you have tried going from an algorithms paper to actually an implementation in a language uh, like Quasm or Quill or Quiskit or whatever. Um, for most algorithms, it's extremely painful. Uh, HHL, I mentioned as an example. So anything HHL based is a bit of a nightmare because you need to implement the arithmetic. You need to be able to do these like controlled rotations based off of values stored in some qubits. Uh, you need to be able to do the, the RAM type queries. There's a whole load of stuff you need to do. So we're trying to get to the point where it's only really a couple of lines because things like the, the pointers and so on um, do this for you, you know, take care of a lot of these, uh, these things that in a paper are a wave of a hand of, oh, of course it can be done in, you know, in kind of linear time or in whatever. Um, but, uh, but that are actually very tedious to, to try to figure out how to implement. Um, and it's, so it's kind of more focused on allowing you to start to build up data structures. And this is something I really want to encourage people to explore because there is quite a lot of focus on quantum algorithms, but there is virtually nothing done on data structures. I, I mean, I could, I could ask you guys, you know, can any of you name more than three different non-trivial quantum data structures? No. <laughs> right, but there's loads of classical ones, right? Uh, and they're, they're a huge part of classical algorithms, right? you know, what, what data structure techniques you use. Um, so, you know, I really want to encourage people to explore this more. Uh, and then the other side of it is that you can use the, the high level uh, language, uh, Brilliant, to define new data structures, uh, new, uh, new data types rather, that it, so by classes, so that you can implement them, uh, so that you can call them in the source code at the higher level. So for example, if I wanted to add a graph data type, instead of just standard MATLAB, I now have a new, a new, type, of, a new type of object that, I have, uh, that I've created written in the, the lower level language because I need to take some advantage of, uh, you know, 
if I want to do better than classical, I'm going to need to implement it in some kind of quantum way. So if I need to use some kind of new techniques to do that, I'm going to need to do that at a lower level where I have access to the quantum stuff to extend the language above. So this is more aimed at, you know, being able to, uh, to write libraries that can be programmed using the kind of classical level stuff and so on. So this is much more focused, uh, Brilliant's more focused on the kind of quantum algorithms level. And then Carbon is focused on, uh, you know, the non-quantum level, right? So people that are not quantum computing experts, right? That ha do not work in the area, you know, that maybe want to evaluate it for future planning and stuff like this. But ultimately the point of doing this is to build software tools so that you can program quantum computers in a useful way to do what you want them to do, right? So that you can build more complex software and so on. And yes, we're a long way off having the hardware to support some of it. Um, but that's the point of that level. It's to make it much more accessible so that we completely abstract away the quantum mechanics and the quantum computation aspect. So if you're a conventional software engineer, you can write code that is actually useful. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank, uh, thank you for the thank you for the answer, Joe. Thanks. Sure. Um, yeah. So I just wanted to. We should probably wind up questions there because because we've been going for for a while now, and um, and Joe's been speaking for such a long time, giving us an amazing presentation. Um, so if everyone could be, you know virtually thank Joe again uh, for an excellent presentation. And if you have any further questions, um, shoot him an email and ask. I'm sure Joe will be very keen and eager to, to talk to you about anything that you want to talk about. So um, thanks again, Joe, for agreeing to give this, or for giving this presentation. Um, and it's been really interesting. It's been really, actually really great to see how much Horizon has developed over the last year or so. It's, yeah, really exciting to see. Thanks okay. very much. Thanks for the opportunity. Okay, thanks. See you guys.